Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming here to the Sackler Center today. My name is Rebecca Taffel. I am the Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. And I work with Elizabeth Sackler to provide additional programming here at the Sackler Center to the already terrific schedule of uh, educational programs that happen here within the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to welcome you all today to this panel, Building Women's Knowledge Institutions, a conversation in honor of Mariam Chamberlain, and to welcome uh, today's panelists, Deborah Schultz, uh, Gwendolyn Beetham, and Florence Howe. Uh, thank you to them, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to all of you for being here. For the past seven years, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, the permanent home to the dinner party by Judy Chicago, has been a vibrant exhibition, programming, and education space. As a nexus for feminist art, theory, and activism, the Sackler Center's um, feminist art and her story galleries display critically acclaimed exhibitions, and uh, here in its forum uh, is a venue for lectures, dialogue, and a platform for advocacy of women's issues. Critical to the mission uh, is this type of active public programming related both to current exhibitions at the museum uh, here in the Sackler Center and also to uh, contemporary and historical feminist political uh, and social issues. Ongoing film screenings, scholarly lectures, artist talks, performances, panel discussions, and symposia have explored wide-ranging topics from art history to sex trafficking industry to the horrors of mass incarceration. Um, at the Sackler Center's website, you can view uh, all of the past programs, many of the past programs. So visit uh, www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash video. Um, through the dinner party, Judy Chicago sought to halt the erasure of women from history, uh, celebrating and forever memorializing the 1,038 women commemorated within it. And here at the Sackler Center, uh, as a whole, is one way that feminism has been injected to the traditional institution of an encyclopedic museum, advocating for change from the inside out. Today's panel explores this very relationship between institutions and feminism through the experiences of those who've created these institutions for social change. Dr. Deborah Schultz, today's moderator, is a historian and the author of Going South, Jewish Women in the Civil Rights Movement. A Brooklyn native, she currently teaches US women's and modern European history at Kingsborough Community College. At KCC, she leads the Brooklyn Public Scholars Program, which is linking teaching and scholarship to local communities. She also has taught history and women's studies at the New School, Rutgers University, and LaGuardia Community College. As founder of the Soros Foundation's International Women's Program, she served for 10 years as its director of programs. Her international human rights work includes post-conflict transitional justice issues and gender justice. In her formative feminist years, she founded a women's studies program at her Brooklyn Public High School and later became assistant director of the National Council for Research on Women. Please help me welcome Deborah Schultz, who will introduce today's panelists and moderate this conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, first, I'd like to thank Rebecca and Jess Wilcox and the team at the Sackler Center um, for all the great programming that you do here. And I'd like to express particular gratitude to Elizabeth Sackler, who is the premier feminist institution builder par excellence. Um, I saw the dinner party here when I was much younger than I am today, uh, when it was first traveling and I was an earnest young feminist on my way to becoming a women's historian, and it really um, transformed my mind um, as the kind of physical embodiment of the erasure of women's history um, that I was starting to understand. So it's really a thrill to be speaking, as always, right next door to the dinner party, um, and always feel gratitude for the fact that it has its permanent home in Brooklyn because of Elizabeth Sackler. Um, I'm also very thrilled, I don't know if everybody here knows, that Dr. Sackler will, is the first woman chair of the board of the Brooklyn Museum in its almost 200-year history. So I consider that another, yes. 
great moment of feminist institution building and infiltration. Um, and we have a lot to look forward to um, from this institution as she goes forward. So this setting could not be more perfect for our talk about knowledge and information about women. Um, and today we're going to focus on women's studies and research on women um, and honor the field with one of its founders, Florence Howe, and another founder who you may know less about, but who is a dear friend of all of ours, Mariam Chamberlain, who unfortunately died last year. But we want to share a little bit about Mariam and uh, what she taught us. Um, when she died, the New York Times referred to her as the fairy godmother of women's studies, which I think is actually perfect. Um, I think Florence will tell you more about how she earned this title initially um, as a program officer at the Ford Foundation, who had the vision to really understand what women's studies could and would become and, and supported it. So um, I'm going to say a little bit about her background by way of introduction of Mariam, and then I will introduce Florence and Gwen. So Mariam was born in 1918 to Armenian immigrant parents. Um, she died last year just short of her 95th birthday. Overcoming her father's objection to girls' education, she eventually earned a PhD in economics from Harvard University. She loved talking about doing research with her mentor, the Nobel Prize winning economist Vasily Leontiev. She also enjoyed talking about her work during World War II with the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, and um, some of us enjoyed thinking about the fact that she was probably a spy. Uh, <laughs> But in reality, even that work exemplified Mariam's subsequent approach to women's studies. Um, being an unpretentious person, she did not believe you earned a doctorate to show off how brilliant you were. You earned a doctorate to learn how to use knowledge in the service of a better world. And um, that's a message that she transmitted to all of us who were lucky enough to work with her. On the day I met Mariam, over 27 years ago, the day of my job interview at the National Council for Research on Women, um, the council was located at Hunter College at Roosevelt House, which was the home that Sarah Delano built for Franklin and Eleanor when they first got married. It's a double house, so she could, and it's connected, so she could check up on them. Uh, so it had a, a complex gendered history, I guess. Um, but it was a wonderful part of Hunter's um, clubs and public institutions, and we were fortunate to have an office on the sixth floor. So I rode upstairs in FDR's rickety little elevator um, that he had his wheelchair in. And not knowing what to expect, I entered a very bright office um, with a gigantic wooden desk, much bigger than this desk, and a little tiny woman sitting behind that desk. And the desk was littered with papers. And as we can all tell you, Mary knew where everything was, even though it didn't look that way. Um, and I felt very welcomed by this woman, this tiny woman with a very warm smile. And um, I got to walk through that office for six years of my working life, and I feel very lucky about that. Um, Mariam helped found the National Council for Research on Women in 1981 uh, and served as its president for many years. When I encountered it six years after its founding, it was a network of 75 centers for research on women some of them based at universities, but others freestanding um, public policy centers for women. And this was completely unprecedented. It's not that long ago, but I think it's hard for us to remember um, how unique all of these centers were. And I personally felt very lucky to have found a place to work there. Um, so Mariam was there at, literally at the beginning of my life as a professional feminist, an occupation I didn't know existed before then. Um, and I was there to witness her efforts to help hundreds of people who came and sat with her at that desk, seeking advice, connections, strategy, um, and sometimes just the experience of being listened to, because Mariam was an incredible listener, and she knew how to take what she heard um, and use it to empower people. So um, we are all going to talk about what we learned from her, how we applied it, um, but for now I just want to introduce her to you and note her wisdom, generosity, and love of all kinds of people. So what we have in common is our friendship with Mariam, and um, I feel lucky that through Mariam I got to meet these two wonderful women, and 
hundreds of other great feminists. So um, now I'd like to introduce you to them. Dr. Florence Howe, author, editor, publisher, and teacher, is an internationally recognized leader of the modern feminist movement. She became closely involved with the women's movement after her participation in the civil rights and anti-war movements in the 1960s. Described by colleagues as the Elizabeth Cady Stanton of women's studies, which I love, um, Howe began teaching women's studies courses even before such things existed. She founded the Feminist Press, which lar while larger publishing houses were ignoring women authors, and the press published hundreds of authors. I will only name a few notable writers that you will recognize. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Agnes Medley, Kate Chopin, Tilly Olson, Grace Paley, Paula Marshall, Marilyn French, Alice Walker, and Zora Neale Hurston, many of whose works had been out of print for decades. She's been a president of the Modern Language Association, has written many books and articles, contributed to many anthologies, um, has published essays in the Harvard Educational Review, The Nation, the New York Review of Books, and the Women's Review of Books, has written many books, um, the most recent of which I will recommend to you, her memoir called A Life in Motion, and maybe you'll tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I'd also like to introduce Gwen. When I left the National Council for Research on Women to finish my doctorate, I felt I was leaving it in very good younger feminist hands with Gwen and a circle of wonderful young women who helped to take the council forward. Um, best of all, we shared the wonderful experience of being mentored and befriended by Mariam. And I know that Mariam was particularly proud of the way Gwen carried on the feminist knowledge tradition. So let me tell you a little bit about her accomplishments. Dr. Gwendolyn Beetham is an independent scholar living in Brooklyn, New York. She has worked for women's research institutes and international gender justice organizations and has taught gender studies at the London School of Economics, Rutgers University, and Brooklyn College. Her work has been published in various collections, journals, and online publications. She currently edits the series The Academic Feminist for Feministing.com, and I believe she'll tell us a little bit more about that, and is the co-editor of the four-volume collection Gender, Poverty, and Development. She has a PhD from the Gender Institute at the London School of Economics. So let me welcome them both, and please join me in thanking them. And now we will hear from Florence. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Marion Chamberlain was my dear friend, mentor, grant giver, and colleague for 40 years. We first met in April 1971 when she called a meeting mainly of academic scholar feminists in order to map a program of giving by the Ford Foundation. She was interested in me because I mentioned that I had a list. I had names on this list. New college courses on women that faculty had begun to teach. These faculty called the courses female studies or women's studies or feminist studies. Clearly, this was the way that social or political movements begin without organization or leadership. These were only mostly individual isolated outposts, which because of an intrepid undergraduate at Goucher College named Carol Allen, I had on a list Faculty had written to me because a journal called College English had published my course syllabus and my essay about the composition course focused on women writers I'd been teaching since the mid-60s in order to improve the writing of my women students. I wasn't a feminist. I would not even have recognized the word in the mid-60s. But at the time of Mariam's meeting at Ford in 1971, I had information about two women's studies programs and about 610 courses that had just sprung up, magically it seemed. When we met a few weeks after that initial meeting, 
Mariam said she wanted more information, and she proposed that I survey all the colleges in the country and that the feminist press publish the results. She offered the feminist press its first Ford grant, and we all have to giggle at the size of it. It was $10,000 mm -hmm. to produce this book, to do the survey and produce the book. That was still 1971. In 1974, the feminist press published in hardcover and in paperback, all very ugly, <laughs> I must say, since a, one of our designers is sitting in this audience. A great designer, right? You would, you would be horrified. <laughs> but at any rate, the volume was called Who's Who and Where in Women's Studies, and it listed 2,984 faculty teaching 4,658 different courses at 885 campuses. I should mention that this study was done through the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> and in my office, the editors, who are Old Westbury students, use note cards to assemble the information. They copied everything out in three ways, by university, by title of the course, and by faculty member. And then they arranged them alphabetically, and then they typed this list. There were no computers at Feminist Press. Remember, this is 71 to 74. No computers until 1987. So, in this volume were also listed 112 women's studies programs, some of them offering majors or minors. The spurt in growth between 1971 and 1974 can only be described as phenomenal. Mariam Chamberlain used that information as a guide for her funding program that ranged through the 1970s until 1982 when she left the Ford Foundation. She, in the that decade, she funded more than 30 centers for research on women, almost all of which had also a women's studies teaching component. So she was really instrumental in the growth and the institutionalization of women's studies programs that also became centers for research on women. And now I'm going to ask the question, why did this matter? Why does it still matter today? In the 1960s, I had begun teaching a writing course at a women's college focused on women because of a mind-bending experience in Mississippi in the summer of 1964, when I was not a feminist. I was merely interested in solving a puzzle. Why was it that poorly educated young black high school girls could write amazing poetry about being black and wanting freedom, while my white privileged Goucher students could write only perfectly correct and absolutely boring essays? <laughs> for a couple of years, I searched for the subject that might excite these privileged white students and when I hit on it, it seemed obvious. I asked them to talk and then write about how they and their brothers were treated in their families. And at first they said, we're all treated equally. Even if they had no brothers. They said, if we had <laughs> brothers, we would all be treated equally. I knew that was wrong because I had a younger brother and we were never treated equally. They were angry about this subject. They did want to talk about it eventually. So I assigned them to write about it, and the writing definitely improved. Then I assigned books by women to stir their imaginations further. 
But clearly that was not enough since I was also teaching liter literature courses with nary a woman writer in them. By 1969, the year I became a feminist, <laughs> students who had been in my writing class could not understand why my 18th century course syllabus contained the name of not one woman writer. And they asked me whether somebody had typed this for me and had made a mistake and left the names of women writers off the list. No, I responded. I typed my own syllabus. And I have to admit, I continued, I don't know any 18th century women writers. They were as shocked as I was embarrassed. At about the same time, I was also conducting a huge study of 5,000 English and foreign language departments, all of them in the United States, for the Modern Language Association, where I chaired something called a commission on the status of women. The results were not what I had expected and I had to interpret them. Here is a bird's eye view. As undergraduates, women were 80% of the majors in all these fields, English, French, Spanish, etc., and men were 20%. As doctoral graduate students, the figures were neatly reversed. Men were 80% and women were 20%. How could that be? We also knew that women's grades as undergraduates were far higher than men's. And we could not blame the disparity on discrimination since women did not even apply for places in graduate programs. I'm sure you can imagine that I, what I was looking at was the effect of at least 100 years of such practice. All or more than 90% of the faculty in the most prestigious colleges, like Yale, Harvard, Princeton, were male. And even on elite women's college campuses, most faculty were male. What was the problem? How could I analyze these results? At first, I was simply shocked. Remember this, we're, we're still in 19... 79, and then, I'm sorry, we're still in 1969, so I'm shocked. Then when I put this information together with my own experience, two facts stood out. First, I had read no women writers all the time I was in college, and if not for the president of my college at Hunter, who had singled me out and helped me directly to enter graduate school, I would have become a high school English teacher. I had no other ambition and no reason to have any other ambition. Second, the curriculum in literature studies was certainly 90% male. How could female college students grasp the idea that they might become professors of literature, much less writers of literature. Clearly, they had no models at universities nor in the literature they were reading. How could they imagine themselves as writers or professors? The feminist press was founded in 1970, almost a year before that meeting at the Ford Foundation and a year after the study that I was just talking about. And it was founded for the purpose of correcting ignorance about women, not only as writers, but as important to historical memory. We had begun with the idea of publishing brief biographies of women and children's books. The children's books is another story that if you want to hear in the question period, you can ask me about. But the brief biographies of women were to supplement. I still had no idea that anything had been lost. The lost idea came about three months later 
when a world famous Tilly Olson sent me a brilliant novella, a short novel that had been lost for 110 years. It was famous in the day it was published in the Atlantic in 1832. Now I've got the date wrong, 62. It's called Life in the Iron Mills, and it was the first reprint the feminist press published in 1971. By Rebecca Harding Davis, it had been lost for 110 years. In its day, it made that writer famous. Everyone from Nathaniel Hawthorne, right, to uh, Emerson, everyone thought it was the best thing ever written by anybody, let alone a woman. I remember saying out loud in those years, if life in the iron mills had been lost for 110 years, there must be other works lost as well. And of course I was right, and the 44-year history of the feminist press makes that clear. We published about 300 lost works and then huge volumes of African works, four huge volumes with 100 or more writers in each volume, and I'm not even mentioning the Indian ones. I'm convinced further that there's still much to be found in the voices of women lost around the world. Well, to get back to Mariam, Mariam knew this story, and we had, for most of the 70s, worked together on issues of importance to women's studies in the US. But unlike many of us, Mariam's vision, in part shaped by management studies, which as an economist she had worked on through the 60s, had also been honed to think internationally. In early 1980, this is about a year after we met, she called me up to say, enough of the US. Please come with me to look at women's studies in three European countries, England, France, and Italy. She had made several small women's studies grants to institutions in each country, and she wanted to see what had happened there and what else might be done. She also knew that there was to be a UNESCO meeting on women's studies in April of that year, and though I didn't know it then, she planned to name me as the US representative. Finally, she also had plans for the United Nations meeting at Copenhagen in 1980 in the summer. As part of her funding program for women's studies, she would give the feminist press $5,000 to organize a presence at that Copenhagen conference, and she would also use her influence so that the UN itself would give the feminist press another 5000 for the same purpose. And again, $10,000 went a long way in 1980. Marion was an unusual program officer in that at least with this project, she was ready to enjoy being, in part, a participant, seeing the project close up. We were certainly partners as we traveled to Oxford, then London, Paris, and Rome to interview those who had Ford grants and others who would like to have them. Marion was not shy about stating her interests. She knew how to move movements forward. Conferences were an important instrument, as were centers for networking and information gathering. And while she was somewhat disappointed for those in Britain and Paris who were indifferent to her stated interest, she saw the Italians as moving intrepidly on their own to construct networks and conferences and rewarded, themselves, rewarded them accordingly. Within a year, the feminist press had published a book about the kinds of women's studies the Italians were creating in combination with trade unions, very unusual work. 
to enhance work and study opportunities for women. Perhaps most interesting was that at the United Nations Conference in Copenhagen, Mariam felt free enough to behave sometimes as a staff member might, taking her turn at the coffee machine in the meeting rooms we occupied for the two weeks of the conference, and then switching gears to pick up a dinner bill at planning meetings in the evening. And finally, she hosted an end of conference party for the several hundred participants who had been speakers or audience at our 35 different sessions. One of Mariam's last grants to the feminist press came out of these UN conferences. For the first five years following the meeting in Copenhagen in 1980, we were to be the partner organizer of something called an international network of women's studies with the Center for Policy Studies in New Delhi, India, serving as the other partner. We were to use the several hundred thousand dollars, this was a large grant, to visit and offer collegial services to various kinds of women's studies programs around the world. And we were to hold focused international conferences in the US and elsewhere. Mariam's dream was big time and never to be realized since she was cut off when her job disappeared. But she had talked about it with me often. Though she was not a reader of fiction, which was ultimately my interest and the strength of the feminist press publishing program under me, she grasped the power of publishing as an arm of the knowledge gathering purpose of the women's research centers she had been funding for a decade. She was certainly visionary in many respects, but few people know how far her vision extended and that she certainly understood the power of publishing for women. Had she continued at Ford, I have no doubt that she would have begun to fund publishing focused especially on women's economic equality. Mariam died a year and a half ago. She left $100,000 to the feminist press, which we have turned into the Chamberlain Revolving Capital Campaign, aiming to add 200,000 more so as to provide the director of the press with a mechanism for managing a business that has never had its own capital. As an economist, Mariam was especially keen. All through the years, she served on our board of directors after she left the Ford Foundation that we begin a capital campaign. She knew that we needed to control debt by having some capital. And of course, once again, even in death, she helped us. If you are interested in contributing, or if you would like to know more about Mariam Chamberlain, please write to me. I have a website, and when we did a large memorial for Mariam a year and a half ago, about a dozen people spoke, and all of what they said is on my website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Florence. That was wonderful. Um, Florence has reminded us of something that Mariam um, always said, which is that women's studies was and remains the intellectual arm of the women's movement. Um, yet, because we are still not used to thinking of women as intellectuals, I would argue the history of this movement is in danger of being lost. So we really are grateful um, to be able to share this history with you today, uh, weaving together our personal experiences and a kind of institutional history of women's studies and research on women. So I'll continue that um, a little bit with my own experience. So you heard that I um, 
started a women's studies program in my high school. Uh, and I was able to do that because I was benefiting from 10 years of Florence and Mariam already plotting and scheming um, to the extent that my teacher understood that there needed to be at least one essay question about women um, on his final exam. And the essay question was, should American women honor Elizabeth Cady Stanton? And I didn't know who Elizabeth Cady Stanton was, and that upset me. So I set about finding out who she was. And once I understood that there was this whole body of knowledge that I had been kept from, um, I, I literally was on fire, which was the name of the club we started, <laughs> Feminists Involved in Reaching Equality. And our publication was called Fireworks. Um, and we had a great group of men and women teachers who supported us in creating this uh, multidisciplinary women's studies program in my very progressive public high school. So that was the beginning for me. Um, and I committed to becoming a women's historian. Um, I was a women's history major in college and in graduate school. Uh, part of the message that I internalized, which I attributed before to Mariam, was the idea that um, you learn things and you put them to the use of social change. And that was not really a message of my particular generation. Um, so I was going a little bit against the grain in seeking to work in this field. And you can imagine how thrilled I was to encounter, um, by chance, an ad, a job ad for the National Council for Research on Women, a place where I could finally put my extremely unpractical degree in women's history to use. Gwen understands. Um, so when Mariam interviewed me in the office that I described before, we had a conversation. It wasn't an interrogation. Um, it was love at first sight. I was 26 and she was 69. Um, and I think you're getting a sense of Mariam. Whenever I talk about her, I like to emphasize the fact that she was radically egalitarian. She really just took people for who they were and um, she listened and she was so supportive. Um, for me, it was very important to understand, to have Mariam as a role model and to understand that one simply acquired a PhD as a woman. I didn't have any role models in my family for that and her support and her example um, really helped me understand that if you could get a doctorate in economics from Harvard as the child of Armenian Im immigrants, what did I have to complain about when there actually was women's studies? Um, but in many ways, my six years at the National Council for Research on Women were the beginning of my graduate education. And I'd like to share a little bit um, about what I experienced there and what I learned there, um, because I think it does speak to Mariam's strategic thinking about institutionalization. So I was very lucky, and this is different than Gwen's experience, because I was the only young person working there with the founding mothers of women's studies and, and women's research. So I got to just listen and absorb. Um, but Mariam in particular really shared her strategic thinking with me. Um, and I will be forever grateful. And particularly the kind of thinking, as Florence said, that she acquired as a program officer at the Ford Foundation and in management studies, because she really understood how to create a new field where nothing existed before. So she said about mapping the field, what exists, where are the gaps. And I think here it's important to draw a distinction between women's studies and research on women um, because this, Mariam really believed in the creation of knowledge that could be applied to press for change um, in public policy, in the situation of women in the academy, in corporate life, political life, et cetera. And as head of NCRO, she sought to identify and link existing centers for research on women, finding out how many there were, what was their focus, what research needs were not being met, and who could address them. Um, these are the kinds of questions that Mariam was always asking. She was always quantifying um, and trying to find the gaps. And I was fortunate to work on some of the projects that really helped to identify uh, what was happening and where things needed to go. So, I got to work on a directory. We all worked on directories and compiled information about curriculum transformation projects around the country. Um, and those were projects that assessed with whether college curricula were really integrating the new knowledge that was being created about women and about people of color across all the disciplines. 
And there was a, a body of knowledge developing and people with that expertise who were consulting on campuses around the country and helping colleges and universities to figure out how to do this if they had the resources and the political will to do so. Um, and, and that's an important if um, because as I started to work at the council, I understood that um, this was a very political moment. This effort to transform the curriculum was extremely political. Um, and one of the things I got to do as well was to research and document the backlash against this kind of inclusion of women and people of color in higher education. And the council published a report called To Reclaim a Legacy of Diversity, Analyzing the Political Correctness Debates in higher, America, in higher education in America. Um, we know that the cliche that knowledge is power, but only when I began to research and trace millions of dollars that right-wing think tanks were investing in attacking the idea of expanding the canon as the feminist press did, um, did I understand that a lot was at stake in this effort to be inclusive. When chairs of the National Endowment for the Humanities like William Bennett under Ronald Reagan and Lynn Cheney under President George H.W. Bush attacked the new scholarship on women as shoddy and compensatory victim studies, we knew that we had to go on the offensive. And because we could never marshal the kind of funding given to those right-wing think tanks, we had to leverage our funding and networks very strategically. And that was um, something that Mariam was great at doing. NCRO built alliances and held conferences that brought together academics, activists, and policymakers to think about how to impact actual issues affecting the lives of women. Uh, for example, the Center for the American Woman in Politics at Rutgers University not only documented the extremely dispiriting numbers of women in political office, but also did research that um, helped us understand what supported women in running for office. Um, a place like the Washington DC based Institute for Women's Policy Research conducted new research designed to affect national debates and legislation about pay equity and work family leave, for example. Um, other member centers like the uh, Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College created new knowledge about African American women and channeled that back into scholarship and teaching. Um, but as, as Florence mentioned, um, both she and Mariam were extremely visionary in thinking about women's studies and research on women at a global level long before globalization was a, a framework that we were used to thinking in. So when I was at NCRO, I had the privilege of uh, working with Mariam to bring international scholars to the US uh, to study what we were doing here in the US, not to copy it, but to understand um, what was possible and to, to give them the space to think about what would be relevant um, in their own contexts. So I had many wonderful experiences with international scholars, but two stand out in particular that I'd like to share. Um, I had the opportunity to design a study tour for South African academics who wanted to learn about affirmative action, um, uh, gender studies, and curriculum integration. And because we had um, many things in common, obviously, about the challenges of racism, there was a lot of resonance there. But it did require thinking systematically about higher education as an institution in the US and, and South Africa. And I was very grateful, um, even though I was young at that time, that Mariam <coughs> gave me the opportunity to really take this project forward and run with it. Um, the second opportunity that I had was to work with uh, the first post-Soviet gender studies scholars. So I organized a study tour for Anastasia Posadskaya, who was the head of the Moscow Center for Gender Studies, which was created right after the fall of the Soviet Union. And that was a lot more challenging, um, very different historical experience. I was invited to go to Russia in 1992 to one of the first forums about gender studies and women's issues in Russia. And I began to understand how a particular kind of forced equality that Soviet women had experienced traumatized them and, and made it even more important for them to have their own space to understand what feminism and women's studies could mean for them. 
And of course, Mariam <laughs> was there understanding that they in particular needed their own institution and she helped support something called the Network of East-West Women, which promoted dialogue between women in the US and the former Soviet Union that seeded a lot of these efforts. Um, so I got to watch that and understand that which was great preparation for me when I was asked to help start um, the first international women's program with Anastasia Posadskaya at the Soros Foundation. And I was very happy to be following in Mariam's footsteps as a funder, the great privilege of giving out those small grants. Um, <laughs> uh, but we in that program really were not operating in a traditional format, so it was really a lot about um, convening and working with women in their own locations to understand what they wanted to do. So um, I'd just like to conclude by sharing some experiences and the lessons that I learned about institution building from NCRO and Mariam um, as kind of overarching principles. So first thing, Convene women and let them debate, design, and decide what works for them. Um, I'm also pleased that the Soros Foundation valued local knowledge, so they um, supported local leadership to do this. So we convened in 1997 about 50 women from the 30 countries that the Soros Foundation was working in, in Poland, in the dead of winter, um, to talk about building a network and to really understand what they wanted to do, what would be relevant for them. That's okay. And what they decided <laughs> were to prioritize the following issues. Violence against women, trafficking in women, which was a tremendously important issue for the post-Soviet region, um, the portrayal of women in the media, and the newly emerging gender studies. I was able to be part of an effort to organize two groundbreaking conferences. The first regional gender studies conference in the former Soviet Union that brought women together from around 50 countries in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, when Serbidon, Slobodan Milosevic was still president and NATO was about to bomb Serbia. So that was a challenging experience. Uh, <laughs> it was great. Um, and then also the following year to help organize the first women's history conference um, in post-Soviet space that took place in Minsk, Belarus, um, a totalitarian state still very poor and the country from which my grandmother fled 100 years earlier. So that was very significant for me personally. Um, and it was great to collaborate with scholars already building things on the ground in all of these countries. Um, particularly brilliant in thinking about how you um, create bridges across ethnic differences, particularly in the Balkans, um, in the former Yugoslavia, where they were working in rapidly changing political situations. Um, another lesson from Mariam um, that I was able to put to use, if you want your women's programs to be truly inclusive, you have to challenge everyone to look at their biases but also be willing to do the unglamorous groundwork. So at NCRO, it was Mariam, little five foot one, um, very white woman, who really did a lot of the work to finish a volume that was called, at the time, the unfortunate title, Mainstreaming Minority Women's Studies. Uh, but that became a very important catalyst for understanding that we didn't only have to look at the inclusion of women, we started, we needed to start thinking intersectionally about race, class, and gender. Um, and from that experience, I was able to take what I learned um, and at the Soros Foundation focus particularly on a group of women I encountered in that region who were particularly <laughs> marginalized for historic reasons, Roma women, um, who you may know as gypsies, um, people who were still struggling to even be heard by their societies and by this region. Um, and I noticed that although the foundation was very much supportive of a new generation of activists who in some ways were starting to think like the civil rights activists um, that we had in the 50s, although there were many young women involved in this, they were never in the leadership positions. So. I helped start an initiative where um, they could develop their own leadership skills, develop their own organizations, 
And I'm very pleased to say that a number of them are also um, pursuing doctorates and defining their own sense of what Romani feminism and, and Romani gender studies will look like in the 21st century. Um, but in order to do that, I, I'm remembering Mariam's kind of quiet stubbornness, but also ability to work at all the different levels. So that effort required um, working with grassroots activists, working with grassroots organizations in all of the 30 countries that we worked in, the Soros National Foundations, the Soros Foundation Leadership, the European Union, the World Bank policymakers, our feminist colleagues, um, and involving many different kinds of strategies and discourses to get people on board. And I'm, I'm proud that I was part of a, a paradigm shift on that issue. Um, so I'm going to end right now um, by just bringing it back home to Brooklyn. Uh, from whence I emerged and where I've returned to teach history at our local community college, Kingsboro, which has a student body of uh, representing 140 nationalities. So while the two experiences I just described, working at the National Council for Research on Women and at the Soros Foundation enabled me to become a globe-trotting professional feminist, um, I'm very happy to be thinking globally but acting locally here in my beloved borough. Uh, to be at the Brooklyn Museum, knowing that Elizabeth Sackler is at the helm of the board. Um, all of this feels very meaningful and correct, and um, it's a particularly great comfort to know that there is a generation of feminist scholars um, who have come up behind me, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Gwen Beetham. Thank you for coming today and letting us share our experiences. Hi, everyone. Um, Florence, you might be excited to see these. I actually have <laughs> note cards. <laughs> I'm going really old school today um, in honor of Miriam. Um, and I'm so glad. Thank you both so much for your really amazing and detailed backgrounds. I feel this sort of overwhelming um, sort of swell of happiness every time I think about the, the lineage um, that I come from and the lineage that brought me here. and what it really felt like for me to come to NCRO. Um, I had just finished my master's um, in gender uh, at the London School of Economics when I came to NCRO. I was 25 and Miriam was 85. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you might think of this as, a, as an unlikely uh, friendship, but from what you've heard so far, you can kind of see that Miriam was pretty open-minded and I knew these two have heard this before, so forgive me. Um, I knew that we were going to be friends the day she asked me to teach her how to Google. <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I sat down at her computer and I sat there with her and I said, okay, Miriam, we're gonna Google. We're going to Google you. And she was like, okay. <laughs> I don't really know what that means. So I type her name in and all of these things come up and she's just like, oh my God, how did that get there? <laughs> I was like, this is, you know, Mary, this is, the, this is the internet, this is what's happening. And um, the next question she asked me without skipping a beat, she asked me this, this name, the name of a man. And I said, you know, Miriam, who, like, I, I don't know who that is, who is that? And she said, that's my ex. And that's what I knew, <laughs> that she really knew what it was all about because who do we Google but our ex? Um, so shortly after, you know, we, we were tight, we became very good friends. And, you know, as every, everyone has described, especially Deborah, um, she was absolutely responsive to younger people, um, which was, for me, um, incredibly important because there was a feeling um, that I wasn't always taken seriously um, by, by older people in the movement. Um, and Miriam was never like that. She was always open, she was always responsive. She always really wanted to know what was going on and not in a, you know, not in a, not in a kind of, disconnected way or in a way that felt like she was just asking because she felt like she had to, but she genuinely wanted to know what was going on. And I think that's really key for 
um, how she lived her life. Deborah called it egalitarian feminism. And, but I just really think of it more of a larger feminist way of being in the world um, that she really encapsulated for me and something that I also you know, really strive to live by in my work, in my life. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of ways you know, that said, you know, the things that I loved about Miriam, there were some differences that we had. So I want to talk about a couple of the really differences um, in our perspective that, you know, a lot of it came from the wide generational golf, right? I was 25 when, when we met. She was 85, so that's a pretty big golf, um, as open-minded as she was. Um, but I also want to talk about an overarching similarity that we had in the perspective that we took on the kind of work that knowledge institutions do, um, and that is you know, really building these bridges between feminist activists and policy work and the work that's coming out of academia. And this is something that's been a huge part of my life um, since I was at the council 10 years ago to today. Um, so, so just starting out with, <laughs> I think, you know, strangely enough, one of the large kind of differences that Miriam and I had in our lives was, was women and gender studies. You know, I'm a women and gender studies baby. I came through, uh, I found feminism through women and gender studies, not, you know, as a result of activism, not as a result of um, really pushing in the way that Miriam did, but through a course. Um, and I think that uh, really shaped the way that I came to feminism um, in a way that I think Miriam um, didn't always get even as open as she was to understanding it. Um, and I also wonder what she would have thought of and you know based on various conversations that I had with her around this what she actually would have thought of what women in gender studies became because it's very different than incorporating women into the curriculum, incorporating them into history, for example, literature, um, and uh, taking a feminist or gender uh, lens to economics than it is to have, for example, a women and gender studies program of the kind that I um, come from. So gender studies as a field, I, I, I think, um, that she had some questions about that. And I, now having finished, have, have questions about as well um, that hopefully we'll be able to discuss a little bit um, in the discussion section. Um, I don't want to go into too, that too much right now, but just to say, I do think that um, there are some differences um, between the important work that Miriam did, the necessary work to bring these perspectives that had been um, that had been marginalized for so long into um, being versus what is happening now. Um, not that it's not good work at all, but I think um, there are different projects that are happening that I think is worth talking about. Um, the second thing is. Um, the online work that I have done and that has been such a part of my feminism. So um, when I got to the council, it was 2004, which was the, really the beginning of um, the feminist blog movement. And so I was kind of there at the start of that, which is now old. I mean, I guess it's a decade old, um, which feels a little weird. Um, but it's interesting because you know, I taught Miriam how to Google, so, so it wasn't something that she was necessarily that familiar with, although she did love to email, and she was good at it, and she emailed me often. <laughs> she was part of lots of listservs and very engaged with what was going on online. Um, but some of the work that was being done there, which is the majority of the work of my generation, just wasn't visible to her. You know, Miriam, she subscribed to, to newsletters. She got, you know, she got the paper in the mail and that's how she understood what was happening in, um, in feminist movements. And so when she would ask me and I would tell her what was going on and you know, these, these things that we were doing, um, she was kind of, uh, she, she, I, I would sometimes actually print things out for her, <laughs> you know, print a website out and show it to her because it seemed, I think, realer to her when she could see it that way. Um, and I think 
And I, I want to focus on this um, a bit more uh, in, in, my, in the discussion and also um, right now in terms of the connections that this online work and institution building has because online work still and online feminist activism still is at this very initial stage um, in terms of institutionalization. So it's still done sort of very seat of the pants for the most part. Um, it's still done in these ways, you know, kind of how Florence was describing how um, women's studies started. You know, there were all these courses, there were all these things all over the place, but nothing really centralized and no, and no um, sort of background institutionalization or institutional funding for these organizations. And this has a really big impact uh, on feminist activism today. And there are folks who are starting to work on this in a more substantial way that I wanna talk about, um, including a project called Fem Future um, that was uh, started by four feminists who have been working in the online feminist world for a while, as well as the Barnard Center for Research on Women up at Columbia. And, um, there are also a couple of scholars who are working on the impact of online activism and really looking at it. You know, the way that, uh, that Florence described, you know, we, needed to have, we need to have these kinds of um, qualitative and quantitative data that we can bring to people and say, look, this is the impact of act this, how this, this is um, real. This is, a, this is the way that this activism is impacting um, the world and you should fund us. <laughs> um, so a little bit of that is happening. There's a scholar um, also at Columbia, something there, um, at Teachers College named Tara Conley, and she does a lot of work on the impact of online activism. Um, and uh, I'll tell you one example of that in case, because I feel like folks still wonder, um, you know, what really is the impact of online activism? folks of a certain generation, I guess. And part of Tara Conley's work, um, she looked at the impact that online um, activism had on the case of Renisha McBride. Um, and if you don't know who that is, she was a, she was a young woman, 19 years old, who was shot um, and killed on the porch of a man outside Detroit around this time last year. Um, she was a black woman and um, she was seeking help for her car that was, um, she, had a, she had some car issues and she was seeking help and she was shot. Um, so online organizing, so Tara Conley's study focused on looking at Twitter, looking at Facebook, looking at other social media forums and really taking, um, taking stock of that and seeing how increases in social media exposure led to not only coverage on the national level, so going from this very localized regional issue to something that was really nationally covered, as well as perhaps um, a, a decreasing the amount of time it took for them to uh, bring charges against the uh, perpetrator who was later actually convicted. Um, so that's one example. Another great example that I like to use, and I use in class as well, um, <laughs> is uh, the Komen Foundation. Does anyone remember the Komen Foundation mm -hmm. debacle? <laughs> um, so the Komen Foundation is a, is a breast cancer primarily a foundation, and they're responsible for all the pink stuff. Isn't this this month? Is it this month? Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, they're the pink people. Um, and in early 2012, they announced that they were going to defund Planned Parenthood. And there was such a large outcry online that not only did they reverse their decision in three days, <laughs> but, they, but Planned Parenthood got three million extra dollars in donations. By the way, the initial Komen Foundation grant was only for 600,000. <laughs> so they actually got extra money from this. And that was, I would say, solely as a result of online activism. And if you think about that in, in thinking about back um, before online 
um, activism was possible. I mean, we would have still been organizing a rally <laughs> on, you know, against the Komen Foundation three days later, and it had in fact changed the entire discourse. So I think, you know, there are things like that that are really, um, that really show the power of that kind of activism and the potential um, and the need, really, for, um, for that kind of work to be funded. Because again, the problem right now is that we don't have the, the, we don't have the institutional capacity so that when things like that happen, it's always, well, not always, but primarily reactive. So it'll be reacting to a particular situation because there just isn't the sustainable structure in place to be really proactive. And I think that's what we need really in the movement today. Um, and I'm again happy to talk about this more in the discussion session. And I mean, I, I really want to say again, um, and I think this links to the online portion rather nicely, is that um, Again, much of my work, you know, from the early days of being involved in feminist blogging, and now I, um, I run a column called The Academic Feminist on the blog feministing.com. I also do some editing on, for um, the blog University of Venus on uh, the website Inside Higher Ed. And all of that work is really about making those connections, again, between what's happening in academia and what's happening in the activist um, and policy world, and you know that really key bridge work that I think Miriam um, realized was so critical when she was at the Ford Foundation, and then later when she founded the National Council for Research on Women. You know that was the reason why she did that work um, was because she wanted to see those bridges being built, um, and you know recognizing that what you did with that work, and I think, and I hope that I'm always, um, that I'm always living in a way that, as Deborah said, you know, Marion believed that you got a PhD, so you, because you used it for social change, and that is definitely my, um, the reason that I got a PhD, and, and the way that I like to live my life um, as a PhD in gender studies. And I certainly hope that Miriam would approve. So thank you so much. Thank you both and, and thank you everyone. Um, we'll be happy to take a couple of minutes to hear from you as well as see if you have any questions and have a conversation and maybe have a conversation among ourselves. Uh, before we conclude. So why don't we take a minute and, and open up to you and hear about your experience. Yes. Great. I'm really um, excited to be here. My name is Diane Rowe, and I um, was involved um, developing the earliest um, women's studies programs. And I had a Ford Foundation transformation project in the um, early 70s, I guess. And I've been on panels with Florence. I'm sure you don't remember me. I do remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at the NLA and the National Women's Studies Association about developing um, women's studies programs on the community college campus. And Ford Foundation, in fact, used my program as a model for community colleges across the country. Um, and things were pretty dire back then, as Florence said. And I, I had a master's at that point in English from Berkeley, and I realized I didn't know very many women writers outside of Jane Austen or Emily Dickinson. So at a certain point, I decided to redo my education. My students really were asking more for more information about women and women writers. There were no PhDs in women's studies at that time, but the uh, University of California in Santa Cruz had a program called, or has a program, called the History of Consciousness for still quote, mature scholars. Still so, I was, <laughs> so I had been teaching college for 15 years at that point um, in, in France as well as in um, Holland and the United States. In fact, I, my first teaching job was here at New York City Community College on Livingston Avenue. Um, so anyway, I was trying to do this, and the faculty and the administration really didn't want this to happen, gender or ethnic studies materials. We didn't even call it that, you know, just let's put some more women and um, black and um, 
third world people. Um, so I got the Sport Foundation Transformation Grant, and we're so encouraging. The president of my college, a man, did not want to accept it. And um, he didn't, he, I didn't know that. He buried the acceptance of the, of, of the grant offer on his desk somewhere. And the Ford Foundation president, I don't remember his name, he called and he said, doesn't your college want our, I think it was $16,000, um, and I told him about the sexist environment in which I worked. And he said, I will call your president and invite him to lunch at the Ford Foundation. <laughs> um, and he did, and he talked to him, and so we got to, to run that program. So um, it's really exciting to be, I met Gwendolyn this weekend <laughs> down at Douglas College, which is the only public women's college in the United States. And they gave me um, a Lifetime Achievement Award, I'm just bragging, <laughs> 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 for, my, for my work um, with women's um, rights and um, incorporating women's studies in the curriculum. Um, and then in recent years, um, I've been working in Afghanistan um, with women's rights uh, programs, and we developed, a, helped the Afghan women develop a declaration of um, Afghan women's rights, which part, parts of which got written into their new constitution. Of course, implementing it is yeah. another, another story. So um, I feel like we've come full circle, um, but, you know, me being here, and I'm so happy and proud that the younger, younger energy and generation are continuing our work, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, would anybody else like to make a comment or ask a question? Yes. people are pretty ignorant about language. So they're confused. Sex describes biology. Gender describes social conditioning. So the two words are really quite different. Uh, and they're not, I mean, a few, very few people understand that they're very different. So they mush them together. When women's studies first began, it was inevitable that whatever course you went into, people were talking not only about women, but about men. In fact, we had no books to begin with. The books we used were books by men, and we were examining sexism in those books. And, and we, of course, always studied men as well as women. But we didn't have that word gender to begin with. It took the sociologists and the political scientists to push the word gender into our conversation because they were concerned with power and gender is, power is a function of gender. So, you know, you have to go through this whole explanation for most people, and it's now current, I mean, even in the New York Times, you, the usage is very confused and mostly hit or miss, that people use the words interchangeably when they really shouldn't. And I miss that man who used to write the column in the New York Times, I can't think of his name, of course, Sapphire. 
Remember Sapphire? He would write column after column about dumb stuff like this. I wish there was somebody else doing it. Gwen. <laughs> the gender studies PhD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, there is, has been so much debate on this in, in the field um, for years. And, and, you know, I agree with Florence, you know, part of the, part of the difficulty is that people confuse the terminology. I mean, also when I, when I worked at the UN, was that? That might or not. If, I also worked at the UN for a while. <laughs> and when I worked there, people often confused um, sex and gender. Or if you were talking about gender, people would automatically think you were only talking about women. Um, you know, like the the gender default is women. Sort of like how only uh, only black people have race. <laughs> you know, um, white people don't have race. Um, it's it's sort of like you know men don't have gender. So. I mean, that's, that's always a miscommunication and a problem, but what Florence said that's really important, I think, is the power element, and, you know, that's really what we, I think, that's central to um, an, a, a gender studies analysis, um, but also, I think, for me, conceptually, the reason why I like to use that term um, or why I think that term is important beca is because of all that it can encompass. So, I mean, especially in the law, um, so, uh, the situation of, of looking at the legal aspect of things, I mean, I would imagine that that opens the way for um, discrimination against um, transgender people and it opens the way for, you know, discrimination. Like, th so there, there's just this wider lens through, through which you can look. Um, and, but I do, um, at the same time, I do understand, and I don't know how much we want to get into this, but I mean, I think it's, oh, I, I will say it's interesting in the context of Miriam because Miriam, towards the end of her life especially, was like constantly on the hunt for men. She was like, where are the men? Tell me about the men, what are they doing? <laughs> and so we would always have conversations about, you know, men and feminism and, and what was going on. And, and did gender as a terminology help to, you know, attract more men into the move to the cause? Um, you know, she really thought that it was the missing link, and I think, in a way, that she's right. And I think, in a way, it has been a serious. Um, it's been one of the, I, I won't say failures, but it's been one thing that's been really overlooked in mainstream feminist movements until now is the participation of of. Uh, of men and really all genders, I would say, just opening up that uh, that terminology is really useful. I'll tell you a funny story about men and women's studies. <laughs> I was on the West Coast after my memoir was published, and I was at the University of California in Santa Barbara, where there's a new women's <coughs> studies program in a doctoral program and it's called women's studies or maybe it's even called women and gender studies and the director had just had a petition to have the name changed to feminist studies mm -hmm. and she it told me that. about it and I said that's so extraordinary no program <coughs> even at the BA level had called itself feminist studies except Stanford from the beginning it was all women's studies and then it became women and gender studies so I said why do you have this petition who is it from she said we have a lot of men in our program who are doing PhDs maybe as many as 10 and they are objecting to getting a PhD in something called women studies or even women and gender studies. They want their PhD to be in feminist studies. I said, do you have any objection to this? She said, no, but it's really going to be hard to get it through the university. But you can understand men wanting a different word. And, you know, they were doing doctoral, they were writing theses. Well, I also think it's interesting, again, I think there's a debate in, in the women and gender studies community and um, 
that I noticed last year at the National Women's Studies Association Conference, there was actually a debate on gender studies, people doing gender studies and not being feminist, like not having a feminist analysis. That was an actual debate. And I think it's really important. And for, yeah, no, it's totally bizarre. Like I can't imagine, but again, like, at the UN, there were plenty of people doing gender gender work who were not in no way feminist, and I think like that is part of the fear, perhaps. Of what of, in the world would they do? I I don't know exactly. <laughs> I have no idea. But I think I think to make it clear to say this is feminist is like that's smart. That's awesome, actually. And they did end up changing the name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just jump in and say that I think. Mm -hmm. You know, gender conceptually is a much more sophisticated way of looking at issues of power. And I'll just share that the best student in my US women's history class last year was a young man from Egypt uh, who was fabulous. But um, I've also had experiences of being in institutions to see that um, whatever we call them, women's issues, <laughs> women's programs, women's anything, things that have women running them <laughs> are grossly underfunded. And um, yeah. Yeah. I was at a meet, uh, an event not too long ago where someone who's been a really long time wonderful grassroots activist both in the US and at the international level at the UN said to me the category of women is disappearing. And she was frustrated with that for the resource and yeah. political reasons. Yeah. So I think it's still an ongoing debate <laughs> and I, I really thank you for bringing up that question because I was about to throw it at Florence and Gwen anyway. <laughs> um, so, ongoing we issue, and we list. have to, yes, <laughs> pay attention. Um, anybody else like to make well, that? I had to, I had to say, I had to bring that up because my daughter is a psychiatrist, and she, um, she made, kind of majors in, in LGBT issues and just came out with a book called Trans uh, Bodies, Trans Selves. And um, so, that the, the whole thing about trans really brings this all to the fore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, for sure. You know, you have you have trans people saying, for example, you you're not allowed to say that abortion is a women's issue. Well, come on, abortion is a women's issue. Um, it starts to get a little silly. You know. Um, so, so it's going off into all these directions that are very interesting. Well, I mean, I think at the same time as we understand, like I, I agree with Deb, Deb's point that um, there are these um, difficulties with funding, and yes, women and gender studies programs or feminist mm -hmm. studies or whatever we choose to call them are still severely underfunded, and I think we need to recognize that. However. I don't understand why we always feel like we have to be fighting for like the little piece of the pie that is there instead of working collaborative, collaboratively and collectively with other people. <laughs> why we have to continue to alienate ourselves and say, no, we only work on this issue. No, we are not capable of recognizing that um, trans people deal with abortion in, <laughs> in particular ways. Why we are not able to recognize these kinds of things. I mean, I think that would only make us stronger as a group um, to to work in this way, coalition, like in a in a more collaborative form. Um, my my opinion. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, in that vein, are there unique ways in which the internet is being used uh, in feminist practices uh, that are are unique? And uh, second question is, given the mass of the internet. Are there projects afoot which, you know, preserve that voice in ways that it won't be lost uh, or suppressed in, in ways that the feminist press have to deal with? I think that's, yeah, thank you for that question because I think it's great. Um, I don't want to <laughs> I think like this is the point that I was trying, I'll, I'll work backwards on your question, I think this is the point that I was trying to make with funding and sustainability for, for um, these kinds of projects because um, yeah, we don't want it to get lost. Like, because this is where the bulk of the work is happening now for feminist movements, 
um, if we don't have some sort of archival process. And there are folks who are starting to work on this, but again, I really think that we need we need um, funding in order to make it really actually sustainable because um, you know things get lost in the internet, so they just <laughs> they just evaporate. Um, so to have some sort of uh, repository for this kind of work so that we can have it. I mean, you know, the Sackler has been great. They have this sort of online cache, like, you know, this, this panel is going to be there um, for, for as long as we can access those kinds of videos, I guess. Um, and I think that's really a, an important point um, in terms of archival uh, work as well as the need for the institutional support to do that. Um, specifically feminist ways, I mean, I think yes. And I also, I want to point out that um, women 18 to 29 are what the Pew Foundation calls uh, power users of the internet <laughs> and social media. So they're the ones who are doing the bulk of this kind of social justice work online. And, you know, not all of it I think is feminist, but I think uh, quite a bit of it, it could be considered feminist. And I think it, it also, you know, begs the question, I think, and maybe we can talk about this is one of the questions that you had given us to consider for the panel was, um, relationships between women's studies and political empowerment and I think it, it asked us to broaden what we mean when we talk about political empowerment because I think many of those young women consider what they do online to be political empowering like po politically empowering and it's not necessarily what we think of in the first instance um, in most of mainstream, most, most of the mainstream definitions of political empowerment. So just kind of rethinking those things as well. Thank you, Lynn. Um, any other comments or questions? I actually thought that we would end, um, I wanted to ask you both what your ultimate hope and fantasy is for women slash gender slash studies, whatever we want to call it, um, <laughs> feminist studies for the 21st century. Um, just a thought, and then we'll end. Wow. Well, I know, I'm notorious for doing this. Huge <laughs> question. Hmm? I mean, I can, I can give a thought, well, I'll let Florence think. Um, I mean, I really like to think about broadening these connections, again, with policy and activist work, and I mean, that really is the foundation, for me, um, that is the foundation of, that's where women's studies came from, right? Um, not for me, because I, I learned about feminism in a women's studies class, <laughs> but, or in a gender studies class. Um, but this, this notion of the two being inextricably linked, um, I think I would want to continue to see that grow. And where it has sort of gone away, kind of maybe come back and be strengthened a bit, because I do think, um, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, but I would love to talk to anybody about, um, I don't have a website, but I'm on Twitter, at Gwendolyn B. Um, and uh, is this idea of what gets lost in the institutionalization process. And I think as women and gender studies and feminist studies has become institutionalized, it has lost some of its activist roots. And I would like to see those rekindled. And I think that the online, um, the online space that provides an excellent uh, way to do that. So. Fund online work. <laughs> You're any or shall I say well, something? I don't know. I started a website mostly fueled by Marion's death uh, and fueled in the beginning by my publisher telling me that if you want to sell books, you have to have a website. <laughs> and I mean, as I'm 85 years old, and I have this website, <laughs> sometimes I, I don't write. Even have a I mean, I write. <laughs> I don't even have a website. <laughs> I write blogs. I have probably written in three years 
been three years that I've had this thing, maybe four years. I've probably written 60 or 70 blogs. And they're all posted. I wish some of them could go away. Or could go away. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll delete <laughs> They're just there, uh, and the person who does this, I, I have no idea how they get there. <laughs> I write something, send it to my wonderful person who lives in Ohio now, and she puts it up along with pictures. And I mean, my idea is that maybe several people or hundreds of people who have blogs would be connected in some way. And of course there are people who write to me from time to time who either have blogs or haven't got blogs. I don't really know. And when I try to answer them, that doesn't really work well either. So I'm at 85, I need some lessons from these <laughs> younger people about how to turn my blog into something that's more useful instead of being a place where I write just whatever I feel like writing. And sometimes I write about depression, which I'm now being convinced it's not depression, it's sadness. If you ever think about the difference between depression and sadness, uh, I have to write a blog about that that somebody has just told me. At any rate, I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> I don't know what's going to come next. I really worry about all the women in the world who don't even get to school or haven't ever gone to school <clears throat> and how we're ever going to fix that. So, I, we shouldn't leave on such a down <laughs> No, we won't. Give us a we won't. positive spin. Yes. <laughs> I too have a blog that I never write in, so it doesn't matter. Um, as I was listening to you both actually, and of course I share those concerns, I think about the fact that both Gwen and I have had the opportunity to um, work at the international level, at the United Nations, so we talked about language and conceptualization. So um, I'm going to leave us with a new concept that I really feel has been put on the table um, at the international level, and it's, it's a vision for where we're going. So let's just end there with the idea that we're all working towards gender justice. And I want to thank you all for coming today. And my colleagues and friends.